everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the introduction, and thank you to all of the other panelists and uh, organizers that invited me to talk today. Um, I wanted to start uh, by giving a quick update, uh, the fact that here at Oak Ridge, we're mostly working from home, but I came in today uh, so that I could give this presentation from, from my office, uh, even though I'm sure all of you would love to see my golden retriever and hear my golden retriever. Uh, but it's, it's sincerely a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to go ahead, and without further ado, and begin sharing my screen. Now today I'll be talking a little bit about neutrons, because in, in my capacity as a researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we use neutrons for a couple different purposes, one of which is to irradiate materials, to put neutrons on materials, create a certain amount of radiation dose and some effects that happen after that irradiation dose, and then we also use those as characterization uh, methods. I'd like to start by giving the why behind the nuclear materials research that I've been involved with over the past couple of years. Uh, the main reason of which is uh, we have a lot of nuclear reactors. Many of those are approaching their end of, end of life or end of licensing. And many of those are trying to get license extensions. If they don't, then as you can see in the graph on the right hand side of the screen, uh, the nuclear energy uh, capacity at the United States is going to precipitously drop over the next 20 to 30 years. Right now it produces almost 20% of our energy, but because nuclear energy is so cost ineffective at the moment, there is a strong push to come up with materials that have enhanced safety, um, that will allow these license, license extensions to become uh, a realization so that nuclear energy can still maintain um, its operating capacity over the next 20 to 30 years. This is a, a couple graphs and uh, taken from an MIT report that was talking about how affordable nuclear um, needs to occur and what the challenges are there. And even with a carbon tax, the levelized cost of energy is still going to be higher than natural gas in some of the scenarios that were simulated by these, uh, by the MIT researchers. And there's also a summary showing some recently produced uh, reactors across the world and many of them are over budget. Uh, so that's not really looking good. So there is a strong push for license extensions. And uh, that's one of the things I'll be talking about today. How can we help enable that? Secondly, in addition to difficulties with cost, there are difficulties with material challenges. Um, currently, we have the Gen 3 or in Gen 2 uh, light water reactors with some, new, with some new Gen 3 reactors coming online. But as a general rule, we're trying to push towards advanced reactors, Gen 4 fission reactors, fusion reactors, etc. And many of these are expected to operate at higher operating temperatures and uh, will require materials that can withstand much higher radiation doses. We can see there are a variety of different materials, uh, one of which that I've worked with extensively is uh, the ODS ferritic steel system. We can see that it has a pretty good operating range uh, temperature wise and can be a versatile component in many of the advanced reactors. That will be with the second case study that I briefly touch on today um, in this presentation. But we've got two big challenges. We've got cost, can we create materials that enhance safety and uh, allow for license extensions? And two, can we create new materials that can withstand the more extreme environments of nuclear reactors that we build in the future? So to do that, we're going to use neutrons. Uh, we're going to combine that with other microscopy techniques. And I wanted to briefly touch on two case studies today. One of those is going to touch on that first license extension and safety topic, and the second is going to talk about advanced materials, such as dispersion strengthened materials, where we put a, a bunch of second phase particles inside of a ferritic or iron-based alloy matrix. So let's go ahead and jump right in. How did we go ahead and do these characterizations? Well, I'm talking about neutrons today and neutron scattering, specifically small angle neutron scattering. So we used uh, the high flux isotope reactor. Uh, partly because it's right down the street from where I'm currently sitting. Um, it is uh, back in the 70s in 
up until 2007, the major focus was on isotope production, but after the installation of a cold source and the ex expansion of the neutron scattering capabilities of the lab, it has been a powerhouse for neutron scattering research here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And just a, a, an, an older snapshot, but still a quite applicable snapshot to what we're talking about today is the high flux isotoper can, has, been, has been very effective at producing uh, unique isotopes for medical research, et cetera. Um, it has a high flux, so for things like we're gonna talk about a little bit today, we were able to irradiate uh, model alloys to high radiation damage doses, or not too high in the, from the damage I'm gonna show you today, but we have that capability to put about 15 DPA per year on specimens that we put in the reactor. So that allows us very nice capabilities for radiation, and then we can take it and do uh, scattering studies like I'm going to show you later. Today I'm gonna to talk about one of the bottom categories, the uh, small angle neutron scattering, and how we've used that for a couple different case studies here at the lab. Now here is a picture of the general purpose small angle neutron scattering beamline here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. We've got two, two uh, beamline tubes. The one that I used was on the left there. And we used uh, a couple different capabilities that they have. On the, on the bottom left, you can see that they have vacuum furnace capabilities. It can go up to, I believe, uh, over 1300 C. Uh, we only took it to about 1000 Celsius in our studies. But instead of uh, the furnace, you can actually place a strong magnetic field uh, in, the, in that space instead. And uh, that magnetic field, as you can see, you, there's a lot of spe uh, specifics about the different wavelengths of neutrons that we can, uh, that we can produce, uh, the fluxes that we can hit, and the entire scattering range of, of size of particles and things that we can see. Um, using our small angle neutron scattering instrument. So these are a couple of the uh, setups that we used for our experiments. And uh, there are many, many more. Um, all of these are available readily online if you'd like to look up a little bit more about the different uh, capabilities that the small angle neutron scattering facility has at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, as a general rule, I'm gonna go straight to the generalized small angle neutron scattering equation whereby after you scatter a neutron through a scattering medium and it comes off at a different trajectory, that the total sum of the different trajectories in a certain angle, uh, omega, can be summed through the integral of a few different factors in the generalized equation. The first of which is the contrast. Uh, the second of which is your number density. Uh, third is what is the shape of the scattering feature that you're interested in, which is encapsulated in a form factor. And last but not least, there's also a uh, structure factor that sometimes is important, sometimes uh, not so much. Uh, we decided to include ours that I, for reasons that I will ex explain a little later, even though our volume fractions are relatively low. You can see in the top right-hand corner uh, the way that we set up some of our irradiated nuclear materials experiments, whereby we could have a specimen that we've irradiated to high radiation damage dose levels. It might be highly, uh, have a lot of activity, a lot of uh, radiation coming off of it, and we want to uh, enhance the safety of, of, for the people that are trying to work with that material. So I'm um, gonna talk a little bit about today. Um, we used a shielded sands procedure where we would put a uh, small specimen, usually a tensile specimen, encapsulated in a lead shielding uh, enclosure that uh, would hold the specimen but be transparent to neutrons. And that would allow us to do magnetic sands and uh, thermal sands uh, analysis on specimens that uh, may, might be highly radioactive without end endangering the user. Usually we use three different detector lengths and splice those uh, scattering intensities together to get one uh, continuous scattering curve that we can then use to fit to determine what types of scattering objects we're seeing in our material. Now, in addition to the generalized SANS equation, we can dig down a little bit into the specific equations that we've used to, for our small angle neutron scattering. I, I put these here because um, a lot of times these equations are glanced over in the literature, but uh, many people are asking, okay, how did, you, how did you 
estimate the, the interference between these particles? How did you estimate the form factor? Um, so we actually used a, a structure factor developed previously by Peterson, and she was actually discretizing the interference from different scattering objects um, by a summation using the Debye equation. And she, all of these are just a, a fancy way of uh, creating simpler equations that then compound into the larger interference term or our structure factor. But one of the innovative things that we like about this structure factor are, are twofold. Uh, first of which it takes into consideration, first it, it assumes every sphere is packed, every scattering sphere is packed using um, a hard sphere radius. So, so there, it's almost a close pack structure. But that's not actually how scattering media are. You've got these little scattering media and then you've got space around them, so a denuded zone of some sort. And as you can see in the right hand side of the equation here, the hard sphere radius that we use in some of these equations is a constant C, which is related to that denuded zone, multiplied by the actual radius that is fit in the form factor uh, for the radius of the scattering uh, media that we're actually looking at. We use something that was developed in this paper called the local monodispersed approximation. Uh, because when you're fitting the SANS uh, equations, you essentially have to make the assumption that your particle size, at least instantaneously at one point, so very slowly with that around it. Otherwise, you've got too much polydispersity to actually solve the equation in a, in a straightforward manner. So one of the assumptions is this, the particle size changes slowly as a function of position. That's one major thing. And this total scattering intensity can be the sum of a variety of different uh, a variety of those taken into consideration by a number density uh, curve that can be in any shape you really want it to. A lot of people assume either a Weibull distribution, log normal, Gaussian. Um, we, in many cases, use a log normal distribution for some uh, initial fitting, but we also use a, a cubic spline freeform distribution so that we're not constraining ourselves to an arbitrary shape. So, I wanted to put these here. We can talk about those a little later if you'd like. The other thing that we've taken advantage of is the magnetic nature of the iron matrix so that we can deconvolute uh, magnetic versus non-magnetic scattering media inside the uh, iron matrix. So, we're going to use this ratio that we call the A ratio a little later. Now, not only do I uh, enjoy small angle neutron scattering, but I'm also uh, adept at atom probe tomography. Uh, I did a lot of it during my PhD studies, and it is really good at looking at uh, chemical segregation in, in, on the nanoscale. Now, I would never wish upon anybody uh, to try to do as much atom probe tomography as would be needed to get the statistics one could get from small angle neutron scattering. Um, I, I feel bad for the person that has to do that. But with small angle neutron scattering, we can get a macro scale average of nanoscale features that might be in the material, and then we can go in depth using atom probe tomography and compare some things. So let's go into our first case study. Uh, and to do that, we're looking at an iron chrome aluminum system. Uh, both of these titles are uh, under review um, and might, will be available for you to look up and hopefully in the near future. Uh, but I wanted to go into a little bit of what we've done here and how we've delved into uh, compositional effects on alpha prime precipitation. So what is iron chrome aluminum? It's, it's, it's commonly known, fecal, uh, as is one of the accident tolerant fuel cladding candidates uh, to help extend reactor lifetimes. So one thing that we have here is uh, we have Zircaloy 4 uh, burst curves, uh, what this is showing is at a given pressure and at a given temperature ramp rate, when does a tube burst? And this is important during something called a loss of coolant accident in, in nuclear reactors. We're uh, quickly approaching the 10th year anniversary of the, of the Fukushima disaster in, in Japan. And that was one of the spurs towards trying to develop these accident tolerant materials. The challenge with fecal is it is a iron and chrome alloy. And one of the things that we have to worry about is with higher chrome contents um, at 475 degrees C, 475 degrees C embrittlement, you can thermally age and precipitate out a chromium rich phase that embrittles and 
decreases the fracture toughness of your material. However, um, in a radiation field, this happens very, very quickly, uh, orders of magnitude faster. So we wanted to look in and see, okay, where is the design range of our compositional alloy so that we can help mitigate some of these things? And there's been a lot of work on this, um, and we've identified a, a small region where we're trying to hone in and see, can we see variations in a pseudo-optimized compositional regime? So can we resolve this using atom probe and small angle neutron scattering? And to do this, we looked at four different alloys. And some of them, uh, this, you, they're named C06M, 35M, 36M, and 37M. All that means, the three or the zero means 10 chrome or 13 chrome. And 6567, 06, 35, 36, 37, that last number is the weight percent of aluminum. So we've got a chromium dependence. Uh, C06 to C36, so uh, 10 chrome to 13 chrome, and we've got an aluminum dependence. C35, C36, C37, increasing aluminum. So can we see differences using atom probe and small angle neutron scattering in this compositional regime for chromium-rich precipitation after neutron radiation? And the answer is yes, we can. Now, after these alloys were irradiated to uh, low dPa, we're talking 1.8 dPa, that's only one cycle in the... Uh, one hyper cycle to get a, get your mind around how long this has been in the reactor, about one month. Um, we can see using chromium rich ISO concentration surfaces using atom probe tomography that in the five, chrom five, the five aluminum weight percent alloy, we've got more robust precipitation uh, than in the seven chrome. So we see a, a decrease in number density from 1.8 to 1 uh, times 10 to the 24th uh, precipitates that we've identified per meter cubed. And we can also see that as the aluminum dependence increases, the chromium uh, amount inside of our precipitates decreases. And we measured that using what we call a proximity histogram, uh, which is essentially a measure of concentration moving into the precipitate from the uh, uh, isoconcentration surface and into the matrix. We see some more complex mechanisms occurring um, as we decrease the chrome. We've got more, more diffuse chromium segregation, and we have smaller precipitates forming. This is also uh, consistent with, with the lower radiation temperature, where we have a higher number density of smaller precipitates. That's because of something called uh, ballistic dissolution. These precipitates want to form. Radiation-enhanced segregation is, wanting the, is driving, we're driving those chromium-rich precipitates to form. But at the same time, you have neutron ballistic cascades that are dispersing those atoms and trying to uh, dissolve the precipitate simultaneously. So we've got a, a tug, a push and pull, and an equilibrium uh, trying to form over a period of time. But we've done this atom probe tomography, so, so why, why do SANS? Well, the reason being is we're not quite sure what's actually happening with that chrome concentration. Is it actually decreasing in these materials? So to look at these materials, we're going to do exactly what I said earlier. We're going to use this shielded SANS technique. Um, Kevin Field, uh, now a professor at University of Michigan, is, is about to put that paper out that I showed earlier about the shielded SANS technique. Um, and we do this with standard uh, fitting procedures after we subtract for the, the lead shielding and background attenuation, etc., what we have is you subtract a low Q per O region. We can subtract that background off of the scattering curve. And then we can subtract the incoherent scattering, which occurs at high Q, um, which is a, a relatively constant term. So we can subtract that out. And those curves are shown in the top right hand, top left hand uh, scattering intensity curve, the dotted lines underneath the two apparent scattering humps that we see. After we subtract those off, we can then apply a, uh, our local monodispersed approximation, the, all of the equations I showed you previously, coupled with a nonlinear least squares fitting procedure to back out what is our scattering contrast, how well can we see these things, what is our number density, shape distribution, and based on the differences in how we apply our magnetic field to our incident neutron beam, we can also calculate something that we call an A ratio, uh, which which I will also go into and can tell us a bit about what our material is made of. Now, as I previously said, we're seeing the same trends that we're seeing as a, on a qualitative rule that we're seeing with the atom probe tomography data. We're seeing that as our aluminum content is increasing, our number density qualitatively is decreasing. 
Um, we're also seeing that as the temperature decreases, we've got an increase in number density and smaller uh, scattering media. Uh, up at C06M, uh, the very top three graphs, um, we're not really seeing a huge scattering signal, but, we're, but our number density is, is abnormally high. So this is something that we'll talk about right now. What's going on here? Now, backing out, what is, what is the composition of the scattering media that we're seeing? You need a couple different things. As you can see with the A ratio, we have scattering contrast, uh, which is, which is uh, the equivalent of the nu nuclear and magnetic scattering over our, sca our nuclear scattering, scattering. And that magnetic or nuclear contrast is the square of the scattering length density. That's the uh, delta rho in or m that we're seeing there. And that itself is the difference between the nuclear, sca nuclear magnetic scattering lengths over the atomic volumes as well. And you can see here, I've just highlighted the equations that we've used. I don't have time to go into those uh, in depth, but I'd love to talk about those later if you'd like. But here's the, here's the cool thing about neutron scattering and how it's helped us here. We can clearly see that based on the equations I showed you, there is some finicky behavior if a couple different things happen. Uh, thing one is if you have low chrome and an intermediate amount of aluminum in your precipitates, we reach a point of, of incongruency where we've, got, where we've got a large variation of our A ratios over very small concentration differences. And we can see that irrespective of which of the alloys we're looking at. Um, simultaneously, we can also see that many, many times for C06 and the lower radiation temperature, we've got significant deviations from what we would expect, while the uh, higher radiation temperature at C35 and C37M, we have better agreement between those two. It's telling us that there's probably some iron existent in the chromium-rich precipitates. It's really a, a good thing because it's meaning that atom probe and, and sands are very complementary here. But it also means that for these very tiny precipitates, they are either very low rich in chrome, or we might have other very tiny uh, things with small A ratios like vacancies, small solute clusters, etc., that may be driving down that A ratio and then we're, we're completely being wrong when we try to use the A ratio as a determination of what the scattering media is. So as a summary, we were able to see compositional dependences when we increase aluminum. The A ratio can be an issue if you have multiple scattering objects that are different phases. And these chromium-rich precipitates might have iron in them. They might be magnetic. So just assuming that you've got these non-magnetic clusters that you're scattering off of is not the best assumption. Now the second case study I'm not going to be able to touch on this as much, but luckily, both of these are in the literature. One is in Acta Materialia back in 2019, and one's in Journal of Nuclear Materials here 2020, um, is about optimizing nanoprecipitate distributions in oxide dispersion strengthened fecal. And we can see with ODS, why put a second phase particle? One, you've got a lot of interfaces. They can, might be able to absorb radiation-induced defects and help those annihilate more effectively. Two, you, it's stronger. You've got precipitation strengthening, smaller grain size, so increased hall pet strengthening. So you've got increased strength, a little bit lower ductility, and hopefully better burst properties in the event of something like a loss of coolant accident scenario. Um, also, it increases the temperature regime in which these can be operating in, in comparison to what we just looked at, just a wrought fecal alloy. The problem is, there are a variety of different sizes of precipitates that have been claimed in literature based on processing. And just like many things, you, you give a, a sample to a microscopist and they'll be able to tell you every single thing that exists in it. So there isn't a, a, a very large consensus on to what the different precipitates that nucleate are in the different size ranges that exist. In our alloy, we decided that wasn't complicated enough. We added zirconium. And uh, depending on who's telling you what, some of our researchers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory have formerly seen zirconium react with carbon and nitrogen, while Peng Dao and others in, in, in Japan were saying that, okay, it's actually reacting with the oxygen in solution to create very fine precipitate. So what's actually happening? So to do this, we did a three-pronged approach. The first is we ball milled our powder, 
So we have the composition at the top of the screen. And then we did a couple different things. First, we did some ex situ anneals. We annealed that powder to try to nucleate the nanoprecipitates that we want to look at. And then we looked at it using either magnetic small angle neutron scattering or in situ thermally heated small angle neutron scattering. Um, we couldn't do both. As I mentioned previously, it's a different setup and it displaced the space you need in front of the detector to actually put the other thing there. So let's take a look at some of this. And the last thing we did was we extruded these the same, exact same powder and recorded the temperature history of the powder inside of the extrusion can so that we could then create our models for coarsening to help better predict what the size distributions of precipitates were at the very end. So, in our in-situ heating, I'm gonna show a quick video on the screen. I'm heating the powder at 20 degrees Celsius per minute, and we're taking uh, small angle neutron scattering, uh, we're, we're taking the scattering intensity every minute intervals. So we're actually seeing in real time the increase in the scattering intensity in the high Q region. These are our very small scattering precipitates as we increase the temperature. Now you're gonna see the entire curve shift upward and then back down as we pass the Curie temperature. So we're losing that magnetic scattering uh, capability and we've only have nuclear scattering at this point forward. And after this, we're not seeing any change in that curve. Uh, if I go forward, we can see that from a snapshot of those particular ones, we can see that at 200 degrees Celsius, we're not seeing much of a signal at all in the, in the high Q region. We're not seeing anything that really exists at, that, at, at the size that we would expect. Then, as we heat up, by the time you get to 600 degrees Celsius, your precipitates exist. And this was confirmed on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, when you take a look at powders that were annealed for either 15 or 60 minutes, and we can see the same precipitate distribution in both. And this is telling us that our precipitates have nucleated and grown only by 600 Celsius. That gives us a very wide range of processing that we can use at higher temperature um, if we can not coarsen those precipitates at that temperature. So the unfortunate thing about the study we've done so far is that the small angle neutron scattering A ratio does not necessarily match what we've measured so far. So what we have is these A ratios in the size range of, of 1.5 nanometers, that's about the size of our precipitates, of 2.2, right down the line. No matter, if I, no matter if I anneal it for 15 minutes or 120 minutes at 1,000 Celsius, we have a very low A ratio. And you look down at the bottom, uh, and I calculated the theoretical A ratios for a variety of different phases, and they don't, they don't match. And you would think, okay, maybe you've got some other tiny voids or something that you're scattering. You're, you're working on powders, right? Well, we see the exact same uh, behavior even when we look at precipitates and extruded alloys, unfortunately. So this means that we have more work to do with small angle neutron scattering here. Now, what about atom probe tomography? These are just 47 of the atom probe tips that I studied uh, looking at this, and we're seeing Many of the same things that I showed earlier, carbon and nitrogen reacting with the zirc, um, and not, then the zirconium is not reacting really with the oxygen. Um, this is just to show again, you can get a lot more information from small angle neutrons gathering with one run than you can get with a ton of atom probe tomography tips. So what is the atom probe tomography telling us? Right now, there's a lot of uncertainty. Why? Because your matrix is comprised of iron, chrome, and aluminum. While your precipitates are comprised of aluminum, yttrium, and oxygen. And because of some artifacts in atom probe tomography, such as uh, trajectory aberrations due to differences in field between your precipitate and your surrounding matrix, not going to go into that today, some of your matrix can be erroneously measured in your precipitates. So if there's aluminum in the matrix and aluminum in the precipitates, how do you deconvolute that? We need more SANS, not more atom probe tomography, to help with this. And we also need uh, good modelers like Konstantinos at, at the University uh, of Rouen, who's done some fantastic work on modeling these types of aberration effects to look into this as well on the atom probe tomography front. Thermodynamics is telling us that we have certain phases that we should expect. We should expect 
our yttrium aluminum perviscite phase in our alloy. We should expect some zirconium carbonitride, and we should expect some uh, some other ones like aluminum nitride and some yttrium aluminum garnet. You can see that in the top left-hand graph up at about 1,000 to 1,200 Celsius using these thermocalc uh, calculations. However, if we do this crazy thing where we get rid of all of the carbon and all of the nitrogen, and assume that we've got a perfectly clean alloy, a very interesting thing happens. And as you would expect, there's nothing for the zirconium to react with. So in the bottom left figure, you can see that in that case, what we would expect to form is a combination of both the zirconium, yttrium, and oxygen rich phase and an aluminum, yttrium, and oxygen rich phase. They would be competing then. So what we've concluded then is our alloy has a little bit too much carbon and nitrogen so we're not able to emulate what Peng Dao and, and Dr. Yukai's group at, at uh, Hokkaido University and others uh, have been able to do previously. So they've got some very clean alloys. We have a little bit of carbon and nitrogen. Luckily, our zirconiums can sequester that carbon and nitrogen so it doesn't segregate the grain boundaries and cause uh, significant embrittlement, which has been reported in ODS alloys in the literature. I'd like to conclude on something that I want everyone to think about. And that's about how we apply previous research that has been done in the past to our arguments about what's happening during nucleation and growth. And one of the things that has been uh, echoed in the literature is what, what's nucleating in these iron chrome aluminum ODS alloys. And one of the arguments that's made is the yttrium, yttria uh, dissolves, uh, yttrium and oxygen dissolves, it reacts with uh, aluminum, and you have a complex set of equations that lead to something like the formation of yttrium aluminum monoclinic, yttrium aluminum perviscite, uh, or garnet, which is the, the, the cubic phase. Um, but as you can see here, a lot of that is based off an argument that was done by diffusion couples between alumina and yttria. And what they found in that study was yttrium did not like to diffuse into the alumina. Instead, the aluminum in the alumina diffused into the yttria. What does that mean? It means that they were seeing reactions at certain temperatures based on the ratio of aluminum and yttrium that existed in that diffusion bond at that particular temperature, which would explain why some of the some of the researchers would say you know what we we, we expect yttrium aluminum monoclinic because here it is it says that it that it formed at the lowest temperature it's it's clearly the one that should form however yag which is a common uh, uh crystal in lasers there's a lot of research that's been going on about, uh, with those and a lot of ball milling studies in, as well and in this study that i'm showing you here what they were doing is they found that depending on the ratio of alumina and yttria that they ball milled together, they were able to preferentially nucleate certain forms of yttrium, aluminum, and oxygen-rich precipitates. So just because we weren't able to say there's one specific phase from small angle neutron scattering that may exist, or somebody using a TEM method saying, you know what, we found both monoclinic and cubic, we, 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 found, we found both of these. The question is, can they both exist depending on the local ratios of yttrium or aluminum that might exist at that instantaneous point in time? And the answer is yes. And we found that through our coarsening studies. And uh, as you can see here on the right, top right hand side of the screen, at, at longer we annealed it at 1050 Celsius, the ratio of aluminum to yttrium changed. Uh, and that was telling us that we were changing from something like an yttrium aluminum garnet to something like an yttrium aluminum perviscite. And uh, that's an important thing because it means that if you coarsen these materials for a long period of time, you might actually change the nature of the precipitate itself. So the rest of this we can talk about later, some uh, simple coarsening fitting parameters. Uh, but the key here is using atom probe, using SANS, we were able to develop a model where we could predict based on our thermomechanical processing parameters, what the size distribution would look like um, and what the size of these precipitates are. So we can now use that in the future to optimize these alloys. So that was a lot of information. I'm gonna conclude and I'm gonna say that small angle scattering is a very, very powerful tool. We can look at a lot of mass, a lot of precipitates very quickly, and then we can try to extrapolate 
what are the compositions of the things that we're looking at from that data, which is highly dependent on the assumptions that we make. We need more studies though. So it would be nice to partner with some of you in the future. Maybe we can, we can partner up and do some work, uh, do some good science and uh, delve into some of these questions a little more in depth. So with that said, thank you for your time and uh, have a wonderful rest of your Friday the 13th.